Good afternoon, folks. It's back to Resistance Week here on World War II TV. I, I thoroughly enjoyed last night's show with Matthew Cobb talking about the French Resistance. And later on this evening, we have Romain Breger coming in talking about Resistance in Normandy specifically. But right now, we're going to the Netherlands, the only show of the week set in that part of Europe. Um, we've done the Balkans. We've done Princess Spy in Spain. But now it's off the Netherlands. And... Um, a fantastic story. I've read the book we're going to be talking about, and it's just amazing. So joining me today from the Netherlands, Sophie Poldermans. Uh, good afternoon, Sophie. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I mean, it's it, it's. I reach out to various people for these shows, and I'm really glad I discovered you because um, it's it's a really good book. And I'd, I'd heard a little bit about the story. It popped up, I think, in The Independent when Freddie died three or four years. I remember reading an article then, but I hadn't done much work. And I mean, I'm really delighted to have you on. So before we get into the subject of today's show, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in this subject and your, your background before you came to write the book, please. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training, um, specialized in international criminal law, so really war crimes. Um, and um, I discovered that I'm not really a technical lawyer, but I like to uh, look at these stories from a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, perspective. Um, and I always had a focus on women, so the role of women uh, in war. And I discovered that women are often portrayed as the main victims, while it's precisely women who resist and rebuild society in a post-conflict uh, society. Um, and these stories were, um, well, not really out in the open. So that's why I really decided to fund my own business, uh, Sophie's Women of War, to really shed light on uh, women's leadership in times of conflict, um, change, um, and crisis situations. Um, you can even translate it to the, the current COVID uh, situation. But I saw this women's leadership um, with the heroines of my book, Hanni Schaft and the sisters Trus and Freddy Overstegen. But I also saw it during research in Bosnia, in Kosovo, and in Rwanda. So that was a pattern that I really wanted to, to shed light on. Yeah, and we are in an era where finally we're giving the women who fought in World War II their own voice. I mean, when we had Dr. Kate Vigers on talking about the women of the SOE, and she was reading some of those horrendously sexist comments written, written by the instructors, saying, oh, if she was an agent, she might make some of the a fairly reasonable wife and you just and there was that era in the 50s and 60s where books about female agents and resistance workers are written by middle-aged and elderly men and we've mercifully moved on from that era era now where we're giving these women um a much bigger voice and a better voice and, a, and an understanding of the of the complexity of it as well and 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 their their femininity is part of the story but also it's just the fact they were resistance workers and in a, in a sense, their feminine, he doesn't matter in parts of the story. So um, sure. we have these three amazing women in the Netherlands. And, and, and you know, you, you've been part of, of their lives since you were a teenager. You were, you were giving speeches out of high school about these girls. So it's obviously <laughs> um, very, very personal to you. Um, and before we get into the story, when you came to do the book, is it difficult writing objectively when you have become so close to a story? Do you have to kind of detach? I guess that's where your legal training as a, as a lawyer kicks in. You have to kind of start from scratch and build up a story. Is that right? True. And well, that's uh, that's a very good question. Um, and that's why I decided to really stick with the facts um, and, and really uh, I didn't really want to put words in their mouth or, or thoughts in their head, especially because I knew uh, Trus and Freddy for, for 20 years. So I really only used uh, first-hand interviews from really what they literally said. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I tried to stick with the facts uh, as much as possible. Yeah, because it can be it can be a trap to kind of romanticize a bit and start putting thoughts in the heads. I I've read a few books in the last couple of years where there's lots of we can only imagine what she was thinking and perhaps this person was thinking that and I wonder if they thought and you go, well maybe but maybe not. <laughs> it's best to just stick with what the, the documentary evidence and and in this case the story is good enough with what you do know factually to not need to make anything up around it. And indeed, it's the job really of the viewer, the reader. To, to, to draw their own conclusions about the person behind it. Just present the facts, tell the story as it is, and let them make their own decisions. So um, 
we, we've got this incredible story. So a little, little bit about the background about the Netherlands and the occupation, I think, to begin with. And, and I was surprised reading your book just how late in the war, comparatively speaking, the resistance activity was still going on, you know, March and April 1945, because living in France, as I do, and living in Normandy, it all kind of ends in, in the summer of 44, because most of France is liberated. So it, sure. yeah. I had to be reminded that it carried on that much longer there. So a little, give us a bit of a background about the Netherlands, how, they, how, how the occupation went from 1940 onwards, then we'll go into the three girls. Yeah, um, well, the Netherlands uh, was occupied by Nazi Germany uh, on May 10th, uh, 1940. Um, and pretty soon, um, well, the, the entire country was taken over by the Nazis. Um, and it lasted until May 5th, uh, 1945. So we just two days ago, we had our liberation uh, day. Um, so yeah, f five five years. I mean, the south of the Netherlands was liberated a little bit earlier, but really the western part. And then you can see uh, on um, on the map the red circle, Harlem. Uh, that's the city where the story takes place. Um, yeah, Harlem is uh, a city about twelve miles west of uh, the country capital, Amsterdam. So yeah, it, it took five years. Um, and, um, well, in, in resistance wise, of course, I mean, it, it started uh, around 43 um, and, until 45 that the, the armed resistance really took place. Um, and overall, it is estimated that uh, approximately 102,000 Jews were killed um, during the, the occupation. Can't hear you. Uh, sorry, I was no, my mute, my, my muted myself. Yeah. Right, so. I mean, Netherlands had an interesting occupation in many ways because it was a sort of slow boil there in some ways because the Germans kind of felt they had this relationship with the Netherlands that they, perhaps they didn't have with someone like Poland. Um, so, so it was a slow boil there. But tell us, we'll, we'll bring in these the three girls because they we're grouping them together. But as we'll find out during the show, and please when you're what those watching it you absolutely have to get the book it's just really really good um they are very different people even the sisters they couldn't be more more different and they were incredibly young when the war began so in 1939 they're in their, their younger teens aren't they so give yeah. us a bit of a background about who these girls were and and how they became um, um involved in these activities yeah, I mean, they were incredibly young. Uh, Honey was uh, 19, Trus was 16, and uh, Freddie was only 14 uh, when the troops invaded the Netherlands. And then all of a sudden, uh, they were teenagers. They were experimenting with makeup. Uh, they were giggling about boys. And then they were faced with the question what to do to adapt or to resist. Um, and of course, that's a uh, a very difficult question, and especially if you're that young. Um, here you see uh, Hanni, Hanni Schaft. Um, Hanni was actually the name that she used later on during the resistance. Uh, she was born Jannetje Johanna Schaft uh, on September 16, uh, 1920. And she was actually a very shy girl, very good at school. Um, and she grew up very isolated because her uh, five-year-old sister died, uh, which was, of course, uh, a tragedy for the entire family. So her parents got a little bit overprotective after that. So she grew up isolated, but her parents were um, yeah, active. Uh, they were following uh, everything that was happening uh, in neighboring Germany and the Netherlands. And she, like, ideals like justice and peace were instilled in her from an early age. So that's why she decided to go to, to law school in Amsterdam. She really, after the war, she wanted to, to work for the League of Nations um, and really focus on international law. So, yeah. Because that's an interesting thing. We, we kind of touched on this before we went live, is that when you're a teenager, you are thinking about the future a lot, aren't you? I mean, I think about myself then. You're thinking about what you might be when you're older and careers, and, and you're very ambitious sometimes. And you maybe don't know what you know you what, what you want to do, but you this is when your political ideas start forming and you're and, and maybe some of the resistance workers we think of typically in countries who are perhaps, you know, in their late twenties or thirties, they're 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 already in their lives by this point. And 
when you're trying to raise a family, if you're a young parent or something, <laughs> political ideology goes out the window a bit, just trying to keep busy day to day and get, get put bread on the table. When you're these ages, you know, the, the two sisters particularly, it is when the world is a big place, an exciting place. So I think, you know, what I took away from the, the early part of your book is how even though there's a war starting, they're still, they're already thinking beyond the war. They're young enough to think, well, it's maybe not going to last forever. Um, <laughs> and there will be a point where we can do something to make the world a better place. And that's a very intriguing thought I, yeah. I, 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 when I was reading it. So that, that's, still that's what I'm, their lives ahead of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's Hanny. Then we have the two sisters. Yeah, so then we have Trus uh, Overstegen, who was born uh, in 23. She's the, the girl on the right. Uh, and Freddy, uh, Freddy Nanda. Um, yes, that's the girl on, on the left. And as you see that, uh, born in 25, and you see that, uh, well, they didn't really look alike at all, and they also had a completely different character. So uh, actually the three girls were like outer and inner completely different. Um, and uh, Trus and, and Freddy, they grew, grew up with their uh, mother who was divorced, uh, which was very exceptional for that time, of course. Um, and already in 1934, so six years before um, the, the start of the war, they offered shelter to German uh, Jewish refugees. So they literally gave up their beds uh, for these uh, refugees. Which is very telling, and also I'm, I'm again intriguing that they both had some. You know, a divorced parent then, as you said, was very rare. And Hanny, you know, having lost a younger sister, there there'd been some drama in their lives already. That which which maybe mean again you're facing some adversity when you're a child. You you understand that perhaps the world isn't the perfect place, and it's going to possibly fuel your desire to to make changes. And um, so just incredible incredible backstories, and then. What intrigued me so much is that they were kind of recruited into the resistance. They didn't go, because as Matthew said in last night's show, the resistance yeah. don't put adverts in shops saying, join the resistance, come and have an application. You have to kind of bump into someone or know someone. And, and it was an extraordinary story. And obviously, we're going to save the very best stories for the, for the book. But just, just explain a little bit about how they got involved in, 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 in becoming resistance fighters. Yeah, true. Well, here with these uh, girls, Trus and Freddy, uh, their mother was a member of the, the Communist Party. So they had uh, political meetings uh, in their tiny workers' house. Um, and one day, um, a guy in a suit really knocked on their door uh, and asked the girls if they were willing um, to help with resistance work. And they had absolutely no idea what that meant. Um, but they said yes. Um, and, and of course, I mean, they had to uh, to realize, okay, so what does resistance work entail? It started really small with uh, printing and distributing illegal newspapers, um, but this also involved armed resistance. Um, so I remember F Freddie told in one of the interviews that she was giggling a little bit when, uh, when the guy approached her and, and asked, well, do you think you can actually shoot someone? And then she said, oh, well, I've never done that before. Something like that, you know, something that only teenager can say. So they thought it was kind of an adventure, but at the same time, they were really driven by their ideals of justice, equality, peace. And they thought that this was the only possible way for them um, to, to, yeah, to really fight the enemy. Which is uncommon, isn't it? Because as we talked about with Matthew last night, in a country the size of Netherlands, there's, and you say in your book, there's there are a percentage of collaborators, there are a percentage of resistance, but the majority of people are just trying to survive and just live day to day and listen to the radio and, and, and hope for better times. You have to be a very yeah. brave person. But the girl, the three girls, they start with these things of just st stealing identity cards to help other people. And it starts on the lesser side of resistance but it's all resistance it's all stuff Definitely. that you can be in you can be in trouble for you know it's the, the, the third right don't let anything go any without punishment but they are they are they are singled out by these people in the suits for their ability and and this is the interesting thing about the we had it with dr kate vigers about women is that there's this idea that they can blend in better they can move more freely they're a bit less suspicious moving around 
Um, mm. And also the, the fact that they're, they're, they're female, because the heart of the story is, and that the title of your book is Seducing and Killing Nazis, because the Third Reich may be ty ty a tyrannical <laughs> occupier, but they're also men who are away from their families, their homes or whatever, and they like girls. They are, they, they're horny men, I mean, without being crass about it, but they are. And, and the resistance singled out these girls as being able to play on this. Um, and this is an intriguing thing going on because um, we know what happened to women who collaborated with the Germans willingly or unwillingly in France and the Netherlands. And so, so anything like that where you're, you're, you're entering into a world where you're, you're encouraging attention from the Germans is very dangerous. So, ha, ha, you know, that you said about the, the, that great story about, you know, I, don't, I haven't shot anybody yet, but ha, how do you go from being as they were innocent and fairly um, not plain looking girls, but they hadn't had much of life experiences to being trained to be seductresses? Um, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating story. Yeah. Um, well, of course, it's, it's all the, the circumstances. And if they would have known in advance what exactly it all would entail, I don't know if they would have signed up for it. Uh, of course, you never really know. So they, they gradually rolled into this. Um, and you're right. I mean, because they were women, they were less suspicious. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, they, they could use their, their youth and uh, their f femininity and their beauty as a secret weapon. So Franz van der Wiel, the commander of the, the Council of Resistance, the, the resistance group that they belong to, um, he really assigned them to, uh, to dress up nicely, um, which was also hilarious at times because Truce was a bit of a, a tomboy, so she'd never wear uh, worn make makeup before. Um, Trus was, or uh, sorry, Freddie was this very feminine and, and fierce, uh, very pretty girl, uh, but extremely young. So Freddie said, well, I cannot really do this because, I mean, I look like a child. So Trus had to, to really uh, start with the, this particular assignment. And then Franz van der Wiel, the commander, would uh, uh, just apply this really bright red lipstick. Uh, they looked hideous uh, and, 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 you know, they would really go into bars, talk flirt, uh, talk to these guys, and then lure them uh, into the woods, uh, into the, the city woods here of the Haarlem Raud, where then one uh, of the male members of the group uh, would be, be hiding and uh, shoot the, the particular uh, Nazi target. Uh, and later on, the girls learned uh, how to shoot themselves. So yeah, they lured high-ranking officers into the woods and killed them. Which is just incredible. And also, the theme of this week with resistance is that resistance in different countries has to be different because of the the, the nature of that country. And, and the Netherlands is is fairly urban compared to, for example, Yugoslavia or France. So in the middle of France, you know, that gangs of resistance can live in the middle of mountain ranges and be miles away from villages and communities and go down into a valley and blow up a train and go back and hide again. But in Harlem near Amsterdam, you you have to you choose another way of 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 um of, of damaging the third reich and, and this particular policy was the assassination or liquidation they that was the word that was used within this group of these not just german nazis but dutch yep. nazis who had been recognized as yep. as being collaborators or dangerous somehow and the, the the subject i really want to touch on later on as well is 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 that these three girls who are very young and we know at that age without your impressionable and uh, men and women alike um they have this ability to do this terrible job important job but we remain ethical during it and 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 the idea is that the, the, the particular comments that i i was was interested by is the fact they would always later on when they're killing these germans themselves or these dutch collaborators is they would ask and ask this their, their target to confirm their identity yes before they killed them now that is potentially endangering yourself because you don't know then that that person couldn't pull out a side arm or or, or have time to escape in, you know, i know you we will try to talk about the tragic outcome of one of the women but you you knew the two others how how important was it to them to stay 
ethically focused and can stay human. I know it's a big theme in your book. And I, I just like to get your your feelings on what it is that that got that sense so deeply inside these young women. Yeah, um, with with all three, uh, they uh, that was really instilled in them from an early age. Um, like really, that was also one of the reasons why Honey uh, went to law school and and Trus and Freddy uh, really got that from their mother. Like um, their mother said, okay, they of course their mother knew that they would be carrying out some acts of resistance, although she had absolutely no idea what that would entail. Um, but and she said, I don't uh, want to know either because it would have been too dangerous. But whatever you do, always try to stay human. Um, and of course, that was an enormous challenge in these inhuman circumstances. Uh, but that was really their their drive. So they always had to justify for themselves. Okay, we are doing this because we see no other option. I mean, it has to be done. Someone has to do it. So we will. Um, they could not put uh, arrest people or put them into prisons uh, because it was all controlled by by the Nazis. So they really thought about alternatives, but for them, this was the only option uh, to really act uh, and to make sure that uh, other people would uh, be saved. But it, yeah, I mean that really paid a, a toll on them because they would take lives. So they they really struggled with that. Yeah. And it has to be said, they have seen some particularly harrowing things. I mean, again, the best stuff is in the book, but true sees, a, sees a, a, an SS officer murder a child. I mean, if that, that baby, yeah. a baby, if that's not going to create some rage with inside you and anger, but and, and of course it must have done, but at the same time, they maintain this ethical idea. And for example, they refused any kind of plots where they might be endangering the families of an SS guy or the children of an SS guy, and that's you know, that they they were they were clinical in their approach to this is a bad person, but let's not let's not kill stand uh, by passers by, let's not kill that person's children. This this is a clinical operation. We are not the Nazis. We are not them. We are not exactly. indiscriminate. Yeah, and, and, and especially these three girls, they developed their own code of ethics. You could say so. Like you said, they would not take out any actions involving children. Uh, for example, they were ordered to kidnap uh, Seis Inquarts, the, the Reichskommissar of the Netherlands, uh, his children. Uh, they were ordered to kidnap his children, and they resolutely refused to do so. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to, to, uh, if you can imagine that these three girls uh, within uh, this small cell of the Council of Resistance and this male-dominated uh, world, they really, yeah, mm. stuck up for their for their ethics, for their values, and they really uh, stuck with them at all times, no matter what. Yeah, and, and and the ethics of 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 not wanting to get involved in kidnapping children. But Will, Willie brings up a good question here um, about reprisals, because that's another aspect we know. Yeah. Uh, when we had Marco on talking about Yugoslavia, the Germans there had a policy of if one SS or German was killed, they would possibly kill up to a hundred locals in reprisal. Now the Netherlands wasn't quite that bad, but that brings up that other question. If you've killed some German officer who deserved it, he's you take him into the woods. Now the Germans can't prove who did it. There's no evidence. There's just a dead German. And they, often they would bury the body anyway, but clearly the next day, this German hasn't turned up at his office. They, they know, what's likely to have happened so what what acts did the germans carry out as and reprise on if they did did that affect the ethical approach of the girls yes i mean very very good question uh yes unfortunately there were reprisals here as well um Truss also um i i described one uh one of these actions in in my book that Truss was forced to witness that um the the nazi trucks uh, came from uh, with imprisoned men and they just uh, got them out of the truck, about 10 men and in some occasions even more. And then it was just a firing squad. And bystanders had, were forced to watch, uh, including Trus, who was just checking out the area to see, uh, to, to prepare another uh, resistance action. But that was extremely hard on the girls uh, because they knew that they would risk with 
all their actions that there, there was a possibility of reprisals. And they always had to, to group afterward and, and they really had to talk to each other and say, no, the Nazis are the bad guys, we're not. So they really had to justify that over and over again. But um, they struggled with that for the rest of their lives. They were really traumatized by their actions. And one of the reasons was because of the uh, reprisals, yes. And this, you know, one of the things that, that your book covers so well is this raising this question about to the reader of what would you do in this situation and, and a decision you make at the beginning of the war, would you then change your mind halfway through? Because, you know, again, you kill a couple of Germans, but you could have stopped because, okay, there are reprisals act stuff happening now. I should stop. But the fact they continue, they, they, they realize the importance of striking back because it's not just about the dead German. It's about the act of defiance, isn't it? About It's about making a, a, a statement that the world is a shit place right now and I want to make the world a better place by removing some of the bad within that world. Yeah, yeah. Two, yes, two really. evil acts don't make a good act, but you know, you're doing something to, to you're making a, a statement against this tyrannical regime. And, and, and again, when reading your book, the, the the, the the spirit between the girls, the fact they met up afterwards, and, and not there are other men in the, in the, in this resistance group as well who were who were there, but all very very young, very none were over thirty years old, but yeah. they seem to have a very good network of of what we would call today kind of a support group, uh, but back then it wouldn't have been a, a name, but um and and it goes on for a long time because forty three, forty four, forty. This is the thing you know I, I said at the beginning of the show after the terrible winter in the Netherlands with starvation and hunger and also the freezing cold that's come up in numerous World War II TV shows. By the spring of 45, the, the, unlike in other parts of like in France, the Germans are still there. The war looks like it's gonna come to an end, but in many ways it's getting worse because the Germans are now punishing people more because of the terror bombers in Germany. Uh, there's the order, the, the commando order of anyone being out fine behind the, behind the lines can be shot. There was another order in the Netherlands, wasn't it, where in, in July 44, where anybody can be shot. So it's getting worse, not better at this point. And True. now, Hanny particularly is is kind of on the run, isn't it? She? Because she's been she's she's been incriminated. She's on the wanted list. Tell us a little bit about that, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, well, like you said, I mean, uh, rules got stricter, and especially the hunger winter, as we call it, of 44, 45. I mean, the girls obviously suffered from that uh, as well. I mean, they were starving, um, and at the same time, um, they were more. Uh, yeah, they wanted to, to, to strike uh, back even harder, uh, especially Honey when one of her, her fellow resistance uh, mates, Jan Bonekamp, uh, from the resistance group in Eymuiden, he was a, a member, sometimes they would work uh, with or cooperate with the Council of Resistance, uh, but Jan Bonekamp was shot during a, a particular action, so he died, um, and, and Honey really yeah, she 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 got very de depressed, uh, as we w would describe it nowadays. Uh, after that, and at the same time, she just wanted to to strike back uh, even harder. And it was extremely dangerous, of course. I mean, they had to to hide. Um, Truss joked in one of the interviews. She said, "Well, uh, I stayed at uh, 51 different hiding places. I could almost have been Jewish." And they uh, had to, to disguise themselves as well. So um, often uh, one of the girls would um, uh, go with, with one of the male members and they would pretend to be uh, a couple in love uh, or Truss would really disguise as a man. And Honey uh, had beautiful red hair. She was really known as the girl with the red hair. And at one point she had to dye her hair black um, and wear glasses made out of window glass in order not uh, to get recognized. So it was incredibly dangerous. Um, but um, Honey was uh, nevertheless arrested on March 21st, uh, 1945. Um, and it was really bad luck because it was just a routine check. So um, at a checkpoint, uh, it was discovered by the Germans that she was carrying illegal newspapers uh, with her, and that was 
the reason why she was arrested. And then she was uh, brought in for questioning and, and then the Germans actually found her gun in her purse. And then they saw the red roots uh, coming out from her hair and then they knew, okay, this is the girl with the red hair that uh, we've been looking for for so long. Um, and then they brought her from the, the prison in Haarlem to prison in Amsterdam. Um, and then on April 17, so not even three weeks before uh, the end of the war. She was uh, pushed into a car. Yeah, here you can see a picture of her in, in the, the prison in Amsterdam where she's really with her tight fist. She was uh, pushed into a car, brought into the dunes of Blumendal. Uh, as you saw on the map, Haarlem is very close to the coast. She was taken out of the car um, and executed there, right there on the spot. So there, despite uh, any agreements from both allies and uh, resistance fighters that no executions would be uh, made, especially with women, but she was executed um, after all. So she really it's had really to be tragic because, because we know in other parts of Europe by this point, even the most evil Nazis, the writing is on the wall now. They're going to lose the war. You know, it's it, mm -hmm. the, the empire is crumbling around them. They are starting to not out of any compassion, but they're trying to save their own skins now. They're trying to, you know, not do anything else, burn their files, change their identities. And it's tragic that she was killed so so late in the war. And I, and I put that photo up again, and I think you can see there, folks, the the, I, the, the toll emotionally and health-wise on them, but then the fists, fist yep. grasping there, uh, just tragic. And and the fact she'd been going around with the, the 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 fn pistol in her in her purse all that time and um we we don't know and i i, I was i'm surprised no one has asked on the sidebar about how many germans they killed and um because it, it's it's unclear how many it was and actually it doesn't matter one of the things that normally normally guide here myself is that you know you, i've been with the veterans occasion and members of the public come up with and ask the veterans, how many germans did you kill and you go that's just <laughs> not a question you ask anybody you know that's their own story if they if they happen to volunteer that then maybe that's okay but you never ask that they're doing a job and 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 truce and freddy after war just said you know that's their own personal story but it was significant enough for the germans to have these girls on their on their most wanted list which is, yeah. which is for, for girls barely out of their teens to be on a, a most wanted list do we have any idea about the Germans being fearful there? Because there's German officials. I mean, within German headquarters, there must have been nerves about, you know, go, being careful where you go, don't talk to strangers. And that alone has a psychological effect. If you think as a German officer that you might just get killed by a random assassin the next day, <laughs> that that's, that's – I mean, I'm glad they were terrified. Good, they deserve it. But the, the Germans – were were really pissed off by this clearly um yeah which having an effect. yeah yeah i mean it's it, and, and but the two girls who survived the two sisters do survive um and this is where i think that the that your your friendship with them uh, over the years becomes so telling because they were very different and we've had it on many other shows we throw these terms around like ptsd and stuff but they didn't exist those terms back then. These girls probably didn't even know what it was they were dealing with. They just knew that the things they'd been through had had left this toll on them um, and and didn't know how to deal with it. So, um, and and the fact that their mother was a communist and they were they were identified as communists. The tragedy after war, I'll let you explain in further details. They didn't even get their pensions for twenty odd years. Explain a bit about that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Trus and Freddy survived the war, uh, but they were hunted by the demons of their past for literally the rest of their lives. Uh, they were always hunted by nightmares, especially around uh, 4th and 5th of May, so our uh, commemoration, our national commemoration and liberation day. Um, and they both uh, suffered from uh, episodes of depression and uh, PTSD. Um, and they, they both had different ways of, of dealing with 
the war. Uh, Truus was very outgoing um, and she was a, a sculptor, so she could really express herself in her art. Um, whereas Freddie was more of an introvert um, and she really never ever really wanted to talk about the war, uh, especially to her family. And she really focused on, uh, on her family. Truus um, uh, got four children and uh, Freddie three. So yeah, both women had completely different uh, ways of dealing with these tragedies, but they, they both still had to, to fight for recognition. So th the war was over, uh, but like you said, uh, because of their, their communist ties, um, they really struggled with recognition uh, for once, but um, also the Honey Schaft was executed uh, right after uh, the war in November, she, um, uh, got, she was reburied at the honorary uh, cemetery. Um, and uh, yeah, right after the war, they, they wanted to start with a, a commemoration service. But in 51, uh, this was actually forbidden by our prime minister uh, because of the, the communist ties. So you also really had to have to see it um, through the lens of the time. So anything communist related was enemy. So yeah, Truss and, and Freddie had a very hard time with that. Um, and they, they were threatened, their families were threatened. Uh, both women were shot at even after the war. I mean, can you imagine? They, they literally uh, wanted to give their, their lives for, for, for the country and then people after liberation still shot at them. It's, it's unimaginable. Yeah. I mean, this is the, the the complication and the nuance of something like this, and this danger with labels, because yeah. you know, it, we, some people would want to celebrate what these women did, which, on the one hand, is a good thing to acknowledge what they did, but celebrating being a killer is a is an interesting paradox that's <laughs> it, it's it's complicated, yeah. um, and this label of being a communist. We talked about this before going online because you in a sense it's like the Anne Frank diary isn't it is that because she never got to grow up you judge her purely by those first 14 years of her life and you know when I was a teenager you know of course your mum was more interested in Amnesty International when I was 16 17 and rights and I was going on marches because that's what you do when you're 15 16 17 then you get older and you 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 still have these beliefs but they become part of the rest of your life then this label of being communist is is an awkward one for the sisters. I mean, they did, they probably did self identify as that, but it was more they're wanting to strike back at the Third Reich for injustice. The, the, uh, so, and, and you're very interested in, in rights and things and human rights. And so, labels are very dangerous. So, when you see an article about these girls, where be it in Dutch or English, and they get labeled as communist resistance or something, like, does that kind of annoy you that there's not enough nuance in that? Yeah, uh, that's uh, very often, of course, uh, the case um, that you have a journalist covering a story, but they don't know the entire story. That's, of course, always the danger. And if you're, like you said, uh, just putting out labels, uh, it's really not important. It really the message that they uh, want to, to 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 tell everybody is really to fight injustice because that is really what connected these three girls and that is why they decided to take up arms. And and this brings us neatly to the 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 memorialization and the, and the foundation that you're part of there because it's not just looking back on what Hanny and, and and the women achieved in the war but as you said it's this greater message of resistance as a as a as a word and and, and fighting back and looking at, out for your fellow human beings and and that's you there in the photo there a number yeah. of years ago with the so this, as <laughs> oh, i said this has been a, a big part of your life for a long time so what when you as i said your book is amazing and i urge everybody watching this to, to just just don't question it go and buy it you can either buy it online or if they can email you via your website and get a signed copy from you um, all the information, just all the website links are down below, folks. But when when people read your book, what do you want them to get out of it? It's not just learning about the war. That's obviously an important part of it. But there's this bigger idea of, of self-examination, looking at the world. What, what, what are your hopes for people? 
Yeah, I hope that um, people will get inspired by this story um, and really take a moment to to reflect and to look at your own uh, life because this narrative, the underlying narrative of this story, you can easily translate that into your own world uh, and see World War II didn't start with the gas chambers either. It's, it started with discrimination and exclusion and isolation. Um, and that happens, unfortunately, on a daily basis. I mean, bullying starts in kindergarten already. So if you uh, reflect on that and, on, on your, and translate um, the, the values that these women embraced, if you translate that to, into your own life and dare to look into the mirror and really ask yourself the question, what would I have done if I would have been in their shoes um, I personally uh, am not able to answer that question. Uh, thank God I've never been uh, in these circumstances and I, I hope that I never will be. But I think this is very important um, uh, for people as, as uh, food for thought and to really see what can I do to stand up for other people. Um, yes, because that's really what these women wanted. <laughs> yeah, and, and and this is why the... the the bare bones of the story is girls killing Nazis, and the, but that's really just the entry point to a much wider and more important and worldly and, and topical idea of standing up for rights and standing up for people, and that is what this 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 represents. So, um, going back to how you did the research, and you said going back, was there much to work with? Um, you, you did. I mean, you obviously knew to the to the girls, but they didn't necessarily want to tell you everything uh, too small than Freddie, but was there much in the way of archives still drawn? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it, the, the book is based on 20 years of, of, of research. Um, I I met Truus and, and Freddie when I was 16, when I was in high school. Um, and it was, it's interesting because at that time, it was kind of uh, people thought that they already knew everything about World War II uh, and they were almost tired of hearing the stories. Um, well, I got very fascinated with, with this story, particular story because they were some of the very few women in the armed resistance and I grew up in the, in the same city and I was about the same age as, the, as these girls, so I really identified with them. Um, so I still had interviews from, from back then um, and then the older I got, my perception also changed because when I was 16, I thought, wow, there are these heroines and it's really fantastic. Uh, and then later on, uh, when I really uh, dived into the deep with them uh, during our conversations, I saw the scars and I saw how damaged these women were. And I saw, okay, this is not just a heroic thing. I mean, these women are traumatized for life. Um, and so that really changed my perspective uh, as well um, on, on the entire uh, situation. So that's also a message that I wanted to, to um, put in the, in the book. And well, I was lucky enough that the, at the time there were still some of the other members of the resistance group were still alive. Uh, so I was able to um, to really establish firsthand interviews and uh, witness reports. Uh, and now, of course, uh, people are dying um, and the first hand testimony is uh, disappearing. But I was just in time to still catch some of these uh, first hand uh, witnesses. Yeah. And, and Lorelai says, is there going to be a volume two? And if it is, is it going to be about other resistance uh, <laughs> fighters? Um, who knows? Who knows? Uh, I'm, I'm still debating on uh, which which angle. Um, for, for this was World War II, but I also did uh, some research in, in Bosnia, Kosovo, and, and Rwanda. So maybe it's, it's going to be definitely it's going to have to do with women leadership and resistance. But I don't know the entire angle yet. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the, the 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 final slide you prepared for your PowerPoint. Is this idea, and you said it at the top of the show there about it's women who often resist the most, and they're the ones who rebuild. Um, what what's what? How have you concluded this? I mean, obviously, you've just not you've not plucked that from your head. You've you've done some work. I mean, I I'm not disagreeing at all. I'm saying, what's <laughs> what's your case there? In that, what what have you studied? What have you found from places like Bosnia? What have you found that shows that that, that backs up this? Yeah, well, um, like I uh, said in the beginning, that especially as a, a an international criminal lawyer. 
Uh, the focus is always uh, war crimes uh, in terms of rape, um, sexual violence, uh, which was massive in, in the Balkans and in um, uh, certain parts of Africa and also Rwanda during the genocide. Um, but then when I was there uh, carrying out this research, I thought, hey, but it's exactly uh, the, the women who resist. And uh, Rwanda, is a, they have a 60 somewhat percentage of uh, females in their parliament right now. So they uh, and Kosovo has like the, the most progressive constitution of uh, <laughs> Europe. So there, there is a change with uh, uh, also a path for women. Um, and the stories are being recognized. Um, and uh, I think we, we can really learn from that because often you don't really hear these stories. So I really want to show that and share that with the world. And that's why, you know, I think it's really, your book is really important, you know, and, and we, this is a, just a statement, 95% of my channel viewers are male, about half of them are sort of 50 plus. Uh, I, I, I want to change it. I want to bring in younger people. I want to bring in people from around the world more. Um, and I, 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 as we said, we have talked about the fact that these SOE agents, resistance women, have been written about by men in the past. And it's, it's, it's been a bit awkward and clunky when we read them by today's standards. And, and, and your book, the, the complexity is, is put front and center of their of their femininity. Their 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 outlook is is right there in it. Um, the Great Dominion made a, a great question about their recognition, and of course I'll let you explain. But yeah, Queen Queen Wilhelmina decorate uh, decorate and uh, and Eisenhower. So explain a bit more about H Hanny particularly about how they were recognized. Yeah, um, well, like I said, uh, uh, yes, well, you already mentioned Honey and Truus and Freddy were really fighting for this recognition. Uh, and Truus had received some awards uh, from Yad Vashem um, and well, she met also diff different uh, heads of state. Um, but it was only until uh, 2014, um, I think you already showed uh, the picture briefly from, from my slideshow that they uh, finally got the war distinction cross from our uh, prime minister, uh, Mark Rutte. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Fre Freddy died in uh, 2018, Trist, uh, uh, in 2016, and they all, yeah. So this, the, the, the recognition was in, in, in 2014 and, and both women got a street named after them, which was, which is exceptional uh, for people who are still alive. Usually it's only people need to be, have passed away before they get a street named after them. Uh, so it was very, very late. And Tris, she was always so, she had really good sense of humor. So she just stood there at this very formal moment. And then she said, hey, Mark, you're really kind of late. So this really, yeah, is is how she was. Um, and and it, this was especially very important for Freddie because she always felt like the, the younger sister, uh, overlooked, um, always a little bit in the shadow of Trus. Uh, and here she got the recognition uh, that she really fought for, for yeah, her entire life. Which, which was only to, to important and should have, should have happened earlier. But as we said, it, it was the communist connection. It was the fact they were, I mean, they were killers. Let's not be. Let's not be make bones about it. Their their job was very, very violent. It was. Uh, it was important, but it, 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 it perhaps it didn't in the fifties and sixties fit in with this idea of how we wanted to celebrate women. It was better to celebrate them if they were couriers or they were yeah. telephon telephonist. The idea that they were exacting liquidation of German of German officials is. Is is was would have been a controversial topic to talk about in the fifties and sixties. It, it, I mean, right? Yeah, but their male counterparts did get the recognition. Absolutely, the that, exactly. Yeah, that's that that division <laughs> between the sexes. It's perfectly okay for a, a man to go in and kill people, but a woman, <laughs> a young woman, a pretty woman doing it, 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 it raises these complex questions. So, yeah. um, it, it it any other of your sort of favorite stories, inspiring moments with these? When you when you were researched them, then the moments that you realize these women were were important especially when you were 16 it must have been really just little things they said to you anything you want to particularly remember the things you went wow yeah. that was a wow moment uh, i remember when i when i first met Truss, uh i mean she looked like this really nice lady she could, easily could have been my grandmother um and when i shook her hand I, it really dawned on me like 
wow, this is the same hand that actually held a pistol uh, and a stun gun during the war. Uh, so it, it's, it's things like that um, that really struck me. And at one point also, I remember years later, uh, both sisters, we were at the meeting of the Hannes Schaft commemoration uh, foundation. And then um, all of a sudden the two women started quarreling and uh, we were just looking, okay, so what's happening? And they were actually quarreling over the fact who actually shot a particular uh, person. And, and we were like, completely flabbergasted like, are they really saying what they're saying you know they're quarreling no i pulled the trigger no i did that so it was like okay um so those were very things that will stick with me uh, forever i think and, and then that's very yeah, revealing they together and then they just continue drinking tea and <laughs> but that's very revealing of the complexity on the yeah. one hand, as sisters and siblings, they're competitive over, no, I did it, you didn't. Yeah, yeah. And at the yeah. same time, they're dealing with the burden of having been killers. It it, it, yeah. it it reminds us how complex this story is. And just saying, oh, they were these girls who seduced Germans by taming the woods and killing them is is too dismissive of the greater picture behind this. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the, the rivalry between siblings, the, the fact that what, yeah, one, Truth is a tomboy. Freddie's a bit more of a girly girl, and it, it's. I so I I I do a lot of these shows. I read a lot of books, and I enjoy reading all of them. But I, I really particularly enjoyed reading you. I read it. I read it all. Went through it again this morning in my prep for this. And uh, again, <laughs> I urge people just to, to to go out there and get it because it really is really is an amazing amazing book. Um, Again, so just to kind of recap, this, this, they, they, they've got streets named after them now. Your book is obviously helping to tell their story. Um, they, they, they. What's the interest within the Netherlands in looking back at this era now, in terms of the fact that women were bold fighters? Have you kind of have the Netherlands kind of come to terms with that now? Is it is it okay to accept that women could be, could be ballsy men, <laughs> uh, fighters, kind <laughs> of killing men? Is it okay now? Uh, yeah, it's it's starting there. It's a, it's a slow process. Um, well, our, our Liberation Day was uh, two days ago, so uh, there's always an annual theme. And this year it was uh, women's resistance, so it's very actual. Uh, because also the, the, the narrative of the resistance was always like, okay, so uh, you had 95% of people who didn't who just tried to to move on with their lives as normal as possible. Five percent were collaborators, and five percent uh, joined the resistance. Uh, and of that resistance, there was only um, a small group that was uh, that actually joined the armed resistance. But they were uh, mostly men, and only very few women. Um, and now there's the, this change this movement of recognizing that oh there were actually m many more women in the resistance and it's also really a term a definition term so resistance not only the arm armed resistance but really uh, being couriers or um, providing a safe place uh, uh, for Jewish people uh, because also these stories are just uh, always presented as individual stories while well, there is a, a much bigger pattern there. So people are opening up to kind of accept that there is a change in uh, in this uh, approach of history. Uh, but then again, the armed resistance, there were a, a few other women, but very few. I mean, there are literally only a handful. So for when it, when it comes to armed resistance, these three women still remain very unique. And that I think is 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 probably the best way to end the show in a minute. Yeah, that their story is is unique. I mean, I I can't think of any anything else similar with this very proactive, literally shooting Germans. And yet, as we said, checking their identity first, not getting involved in kidnapping children. They remained human in an inhumane inhumane world, and that is something to admire them for. That I think more in some ways than actually the physical act of killing killing nazis not becoming the thing that that they that they were trying to kill um i remember having a conversation with sir max hastings a few years ago about 
why the Allies took longer to win the war. If they'd been more efficient, if we had had, had gone with the ruthlessness of somehow the, how the German armor divisions and that. And and he he said, as I got older, he said, I realized the Allies never became the thing we were trying to defeat. We at heart, the British soldier, the Dutch soldier, the Americans that wanted to go back home and 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 go to a shop and you know and go to a pub and have a pint of beer. We never became killers. <laughs> That in that way, it was a job to be done. Uh, whereas the Third Reich and perhaps the Japanese, they kind of reveled in this this idea of the of the fanaticism and the killing, and the, and we never became the thing we tried to defeat. And I think in reading your book, that's the thing they retained their soul. They retained some type of not innocence because they've seen a lot of stuff, but they retained an in, some integrity. Their morals have been, their ethics and morals have been questioned. They, they, they'd they seen the reprisals, but they they had, their view was balanced. They did what they did, considered, they thought through. Mm -hmm. I think that's the important thing to take away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is this has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I, I'm hoping now you do a second volume about the resistance unit somewhere else because it's just such a great story um again i i, I urge people to get it. i'm just do my little piece that can remind people what we've got coming up then i'll come back and say goodbye in a second so um i've thoroughly enjoyed that folks so last show of resistance week is coming up later so 7 p.m uk time we're gonna conclude the week looking at the role of the french resistance in normandy and then i've got tomorrow off although i think i'm joining someone else's podcast tomorrow paul reed's podcast possibly celebrating ve day and then Sunday, we start Italian week. So I've got a show in the evening, 7 o'clock UK time. Neil Lawrence is coming on to talk about the Fulgore, the Italian Airborne Division World War II. Then we've got lots of great shows next week. So no rest for the wicked coming up, lots of stuff. But right now, it remains for me to say thank you very much, Sophie Poldermans, for joining us. It's been really good. Again, folks, details of the books and things in the description below. And have you enjoyed it, Sophie? Absolutely, yes. So and, yeah. thank you for having me. So, great. Um, I will see you all tonight then, folks. This is Paul Woodadge for World War II TV saying we'll see you all again this evening. Um, and thank you, Sophie, again. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you.